From the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Thank you so much for watching. Congratulations to Jonathan and the entire team who put that together. It is a really important issue about the information you can see and who is able to continue to make it. If you want more information, go to skydews.com.au and please share that around with your mates. Uh, the full video will be up on our YouTube channel very soon. My name's Paul Murray. If this is the first time you're tuning in, this is an opinion show. It's all mine. Relax, it'll be okay. Now, cost of living is the number one issue we talk about on this program because it's the number one that matters around the country. And believe it or not, because of how expensive things are, people are stealing things more than ever. Shoplifting has hit an all-time high and the cost of living crisis is being blamed. Retailers say the spike in thefts means honest customers will be forced to pay more. And some crime statistics back up what the reporting shows us. It shows a significant increase in the number of people who have been shoplifting. And shoplifting things, not that are the luxuries, but the basics. Thefts from retail stores have risen up to the highest levels on record, particularly in Victoria. Fish figures revealing that a nearly 40% jump in shoplifting incidents in the year to September 30 last year. 25,500 recorded thefts from shops. That is up from 18,000 the previous year. So we're in a scenario now where obviously businesses, big and small, are starting to lose product. That has an effect when it comes to their bottom line. And now there's some innovative suggestions as to how they can stop theft at the retail level. Now, you know when somebody steals money from a bank, inside the uh, block of notes there will be every now and then a little die pack. The die pack explodes when the person takes that particular pack outside of the bank. Here's an example of somebody who did it. They try to throw away the wad, but the pink is on them. They have now been marked as the person who stole the money from the bank. Well, not quite that drastic, but almost. You know how often when you go to a department store, there'll be those little tags on clothes that somebody has to take off before you can leave the store. Otherwise, an alarm will go off or dye will explode all over them. Well, a version of that now exists for food in Australia because of how many people are stealing from shops because they can't afford the food that is in them. These photos popped up on Reddit in the past couple of days and they show that meat is now coming with a security tag on it as if it was a T-shirt, as if it was a high-value item that somebody doesn't want stolen from their shop. Coles are the people who are actually doing this, and they're doing it not just on that one piece but an entire batch of meat with the special tags that were turning up in regional Victoria. Now, according to the reporting on this, a statement from a Coles spokesperson said the measure was part of a very small trial which is being rolled out in Victoria. So, obviously, if it works in one area, it grows to another and it becomes the norm in Australian shops. It's important to note that the majority of customers do the right thing in store. Well, who's suggesting otherwise? And measures like this are for the ones who don't. Oh, thanks, Scoop. Don't you love the sort of corporate geniuses that work in and around some of this stuff? The safety of our team members and customers is a top priority, and we have a range of security measures in place to reduce the theft in our store, including security personnel... I think that's called security guards, surveillance technologies such as CCTV. We are always reassessing and trying new security measures and we're keen to hear local feedback on the trial. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most people would be deterred that Australia and suburban Australia and country Australia is a place where we need to put security tags on meat because people are stealing it because they can't afford it. Now, for a certain section of Australians, the past couple of years has been irritating because they've had to hear about everyone else's cost of living problems. These often are the teal seats, the richer end of the, uh, of the political spectrum. But the reality is, for Australians, it is the number one issue. It's the number one issue that the government claims that they are doing something about, but so often they do so little about. The best they can offer is a $15 a week tax cut to people who are earning $45,000. Now, they'll say they're doing everything they can, but we'll check in a moment whether they've done one of the biggest things they can do. The answer is probably going to be no, but you know the question I'm about to ask. But what we're talking about supermarkets, there is an inquiry which has been set up by the Senate. Now, let's not muck around. This is to try to do to the supermarket CEOs what's previously done to people like, say, the, the boss of Qantas. A bunch of politicians wave their fingers, scream and yell, carry on, threaten to change the law, then nothing happens. 
But there is a problem that has long existed between the supermarkets and their suppliers that goes way beyond cost of living. It goes pre-COVID and it's been a constant sense of tension the bigger these supermarkets have got over the decades. Now, Guy Gatter is the bloke you can see in this photo. He addressed the committee when it turned up in Orange in regional New South Wales recently. And he says that if the current balance between the supermarkets in terms of their buying power and what they tell their primary producers, if it continues to be as lopsided as it is, family farms will simply disappear. Now, Guy, who spent 38 years in the agricultural industry, has warned senators overseeing the inquiry into supermarkets that unless farmers are paid a fair price for their produce, the supermarket then there won't be any family farms within a few years. Now, whether this is the whole idea, remember, of course, because we used to have things like uh, suburban uh, butchers, we used to have suburban hardware stores, we used to have news agents. Many of these businesses have, of course, all been crushed and moved to one side because the giant retailers or the big box retailers, like people like Bunnings, are able to buy things cheaper and because of the size of their businesses and the size of their advertising, people go there and the little person can't compete anymore. And when it comes to farming, are we looking down the future of rather than a series of family farms, big corporations getting into bed with other big corporations and there's no space for, in this case, the little guy? He continues. Mr Gator also explained that the supermarket giants would often reject produce for no apparent reason. For example, cucumbers that weren't perfectly straight or fruit that was slightly on the wrong side of the colour. And the farmers couldn't argue with the retailers because, again, one thing that Australians have got when it comes to our fruit and veg is that we're a little bit posh about what we demand to eat, that it has to look as perfect as the picture on the poster. It has to look as perfect as the ingredients on MasterChef, when the reality is, if the cucumber is ever so slightly bent, it's not going to affect the eating experience. But good food goes to waste. And in a country where 3.7 million people, due to the cost of living, have had battles to be able to put food on the table, this sort of produce, rather than just being thrown away, should be going to people who desperately need it. Now, organisations like Oz Harvest, organisations like Food Bank try to get in the way, but if you have a scenario here where you're hoarding all of the supply for the supermarkets, you've already made your donation, what do you do with the fruit that doesn't look pretty enough? It's not pretty enough for Instagram. Right, one more here. There won't be any family farms in five or so years. It's scary. If you don't have family farms, then you will lose your food security. Bloody oath, Guy. So to you and everyone else in regional Australia, particularly watching us on Free to Air right now, stick with it, stay with it. We love what you do and we will obviously continue to watch your fight. Now, again, I'm not particularly interested in the plethora of politicians which are going to be waving their fingers and carrying on and senators showing off that yelling at CEOs is somehow going to make cost of living go away. But one of the things that government senators absolutely can control when it comes to cost of living is the price of petrol. It's way over $2.00. When it was under $2, it was a reason apparently to change the government. Anthony Albanese screaming when it was $1.75, or what about $2, $2.10, $2.30, as it is for many people around the country. Now, this government inherited 23 cents a litre in petrol tax, but they have increased it now to 49 cents a litre. So any plans for the Prime Minister today to actually do something about the cost of living? Any plans to actually cut petrol taxes? Any, sir? No? No? Still no? Yeah, but you're doing everything about cost of living, right? Oh, that's no too. Now, as we told you last night, there was a major problem uh, with the visa system which 150 people were put on after the federal government let everyone out of detention, despite the fact that the High Court only made a ruling about one person. They say one out, all out, and as we know, the type of people that were in there, you want them kept behind bars for as long as possible. But as we have followed in this sorry tale, the reality is that they were released from detention too quickly. They were released without supervision. There were lies told to us about people who were even released at the time with no visa. Well, the visa that they were eventually signed up to, as we learnt last night via Channel 7, well, it was invalid. 
Seven News can reveal that lawyers from the Department of Home Affairs just in recent days identified what they call technical inconsistencies with the original Abbott government laws that render them and the laws amended here in November both invalid. In response to that story last night, the Immigration Minister, the idiot Andrew Giles, said, don't blame anyone, it's all OK. Look, this is not about fault. This is about making sure that we continue to take every step to ensure that community safety is paramount. But what did the Labor Party do all day today? Them, ministers, proxies, backbenchers, anyone who had access to a microphone, well, they blamed anyone but themselves, the government, for the past two years. This issue was a technical issue. A technical legal issue in an Australian law that had been passed by the parliament in 2013. This is a technical issue that goes back to 2013. This is an issue that had been on the books for more than a decade, since 2013, throughout, indeed, the former government's time. Now, of course, anyone who's actually paying attention to all of this would know that you would do your homework about the existing law before you decided to tack something onto it. But because they wanted to get a quick win in the headlines, they ended up just tacking something on to win the headlines but not actually follow through to something that ended up working. Now, idiot Andrew Giles's boss is clueless Claire O'Neill. Again, first time watching, this is my opinion and I don't muck around. These people are completely incompetent when it comes to the managing of our borders and particularly when it comes to national security. These people have got the L plates on and even then they have failed the most basic tests. They should not be able to pass go, not be able to get $200. How many other metaphors can I use? Now, weekly, clueless Claire O'Neill is trying to step into the model of Kevin Rudd and turn up on Sunrise, hoping that eventually the uh, good bloke factor that he was able to put together is going to be able to be the good lady factor and she'll end up one day running for leadership. But when she was on there this morning, well, there was a rather obvious issue, which was why the hell did you let it happen? And when the host of Sunrise turns around and is able to whack you around the head about the bad decisions you are making, you are know you are not in the best of places when it comes to politics. But there they are, it's all technical, nothing to see here. Clueless Claire O'Neill, idiot Andrew Giles. These people did not do their homework because they didn't bother to actually read their legislation. If they did, they would have seen what the fault is. If they didn't know what the fault is, then they are incompetent. If their staff had read the legislation and didn't know what the fault was, they are incompetent. If the people who framed the legislation didn't understand that it was not up to scratch, then they are incompetent too. What is it about government that you can be this incompetent this many times about something this serious and everyone keeps their job? A point made by Peter Dutton. It's, it didn't occur under a coalition government. This happened under a Labor government. Let's be very clear about it. The red herring that they've thrown out there uh, is not factually correct. Uh, and Minister Giles and others shouldn't be in their jobs. Uh, how the Prime Minister can keep Minister Giles in his job when he's released 149 hardcore criminals into the community on the wrong visas is beyond the average Australian's comprehension. Now, as you know, a doomsday cult is a group of people who believe that the world is going to end. Now, in the olden days of the 1970s, 80s and 90s, these were people who believed that there was a religious reason why the world was about to end. So these people were willing to do any and anything to prepare themselves for the end of the world, but also willing to do anything to warn the rest of the world that the world was about to end. But in 2024, the doomsday cultists are those who believe that we are beyond the tipping point when it comes to a climate emergency. And they believe that their actions are completely acceptable every time when they interrupt normal life to make their point. You see, because you don't share the same catastrophic view of the world that they do, then your life must be interrupted. While they apologise later, they don't care when people, like the lady we showed you last week, has to have a baby by the side of the road because of their actions. They don't care that anyone caught up in any of their disruptions is unable to get where they need to go, and they have no idea where people need to go. Some people need to go to a medical appointment. Some people need to be able to go to work. Some people need to be able to go and drop their kids off at school. Some people need to be able to get to hospital. And, yes, some people need to be able to go to a funeral's. For most people, it's an irritation, but for some people, it's a once-in-a-lifetime disruption that they can't undo. And every time these people, because they are part of this doomsday cult, believe that because the message is not sinking in, your inconvenience is nothing compared to the potential inconveniences to the planet. 
Now, as we've shown you, they've done their stuff all over the country for a while. They used to stick themselves to things in Queensland. Judges used to turn around and say, in Queensland, look, they understand that uh, because they're really invested in this, there probably shouldn't be a penalty. In New South Wales, when they blocked the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the lawyers are able to argue successfully in front of magistrates that their climate anxiety about the Lismore floods is a reason why they shouldn't be in jail. And this is the same process that is now about to play itself out yet again in the courts via what you saw on the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne last week. Today's latest version of what they are trying to do was to shut down again parts of the Melbourne CBD. Their plan is to do this many days in a row. But I couldn't help but think that there is something rather odd about the police response to all of this. Now, previously, the New South Wales Police did a good thing when they worked out that these people were training and training for their disruption operations, and I'm being polite about their operations. They raided their camps and they did their best to make sure that these people weren't going to inconvenience people who were going about their daily lives and have every right to expect to be able to go about their daily life. Doesn't matter how righteous your cause is, you don't get the ability to interrupt other people's lives. Make your point, but you do not get to interrupt other people's lives. That's the way that it works. Protest is OK. Disruption is not OK. The pausing of people's lives because you believe they don't care sufficiently about the issue that you care about is not the way that it works here. Although maybe that is the case as to how it works here, given the way the courts are starting to behave with things and how, well, pee weak our politicians are often in responding to all of this. Well, the protesters, well, as you know, they're a very focused lot, let me say that. Here's an example of some of the righteous things that they were saying while holding up everything in Melbourne today. Why do you think we do this? We don't want to do it. We're doing it because we are not being protected by our government. We need a plan for how we're dealing with this climate emergency. It is unfolding before our eyes and we all know it. Our whole society is built on being able to produce food. We're looking at mass starvation which will lead to civilizational collapse. It's our intention to pressure the government because time has run out. We're at 1.5 degrees of warming. Now, also, people have been very open about their plans to disrupt. In fact, this was a story from a couple of days ago where a protester for a prominent climate activist group had warned of an act of mass civil disobedience was to be held this weekend and hopes that hundreds of people will be arrested. Members of the Extinction Rebellion in Victoria again took to the streets at Melbourne CBD as part of their five-day rebel for life, baby. They slowed down Collins Street on Tuesday and an unnamed member of the group was live streaming from the demonstration, highlighting a planned series for a mass civil disobedience hoping to be held on Saturday where they hope to get one to 200 people arrested. That would mean that they are planning to do something that would be considered illegal. I don't know what they are planning to do. I don't know what mass disobedience means. But isn't it interesting that we have not had a single arrest based off that threat? Not a single arrest based off the people who are making the decisions to decide where these protests go. Which is very different than, of course, when everyone was told to stay in their house, when helicopters were flying over because you may or may not end up getting the woo flu. You see, remember that lady who just posted a link to a protest at the height of COVID? That's all she did. She, of course, was met by the police, was arrested, was pregnant. That video went around the world. This person is live streaming, saying publicly that they hope one to 200 people, 100 to 200 people are going to break the law on Saturday. Yet, where is the preemptive arresting? And then there's the other point here, that the next time you're doing the live cross with these people in the breakfast shows or you're live on television or you get the chance to talk to them, could you ask them why they're protesting in the heart of Melbourne and not going to a specific part of Melbourne? You see, the inconvenient truth for even the doomsdayers is that Australia is not the problem when it comes to global emissions. Are we part of it? Sure. But according to the Union of Concerned Scientists and many others, Australia's contribution is the best part of 1% to global emissions. The protest, again, in the centre of Melbourne that took place today may need to actually refocus themselves. Rather than making a spectacle of themselves of which the media eats up, perhaps they could find a way to actually go to a place that represents in Melbourne the, what, 30% of global emissions? It's called the Chinese consulate. In fact, I've even done a map for them. 
You see, you can use your Google map. It'll take you an hour and 45 to walk there. I know, it's going to be tough. But you're protesting for life, OK? You're rebelling for life. So if you would like to make a point about the people who are polluting the planet 30 times more than Australia is, more than any other country in the world, then feel free to get off your ass and go over to the Chinese consulate. It's pretty easy. You're able to go and find it. Type it into all of the devices. The internet has not been censored yet. Go and protest in front of the organisation that represents the country that is actually polluting the world at a greater rate than anyone else. The organisation that, of course, is going to be able to continue to pollute the world until 2030 at a doubling of every single day of pollution because under the Paris Agreement, they don't have to do anything until 2030. And by the way, their net zero target is not 2040, not 2050, like the rest of the world. It is, of course, 2060. The reason for this garbage is because they're able to mark their own homework and call themselves a developing nation. But unlike many developing nations in Africa, this one has hosted two Olympic Games this century. Unlike many developing parts of Asia, they're... They have a space program. They have their own international space station, which, last time I checked, is not what a developing country does. For his part, of course, uh, Chris Bowen believes that the way to save the world, because he's, of course, the uh, Extinction Rebellion adjacent person, standing there in a suit representing mainstream opinion, where he believes that the future of this country is all about electric vehicles. Despite the fact that just last year, 77% of all of the cars that were sold in Australia were either SUVs, the family big cars, or the light commercial vehicles, otherwise known as things like utes. Now, utes and SUVs are what Australians like to buy because it is what fits their life. There are some electronic equivalents, but they certainly aren't as cheap, and they certainly aren't as effective, and they certainly aren't able to be filled in the time that it takes you to fill a petrol tank. Even if you can find a charger, it will take a little longer than the five minutes to go in, fill it full of petrol or diesel, pay the petrol tax that the Prime Minister hasn't cut again today, and then on you go. Well, we learned today, on behalf of the motoring bodies that actually sell 70-something percent of the cars that Australians want, but, of course, that's 70 percent of a market that this government believes should be electric vehicles, that there are going to be serious consequences much sooner rather than later. In fact, they believe that half of all new utes and light commercial vehicles sold by 2029 would need to be electric to meet Labor's fuel efficiency standards and new initiatives to shift more motorists away from petrol and diesel, which will likely fail, according to the new industry data. So despite the fact that apparently a huge chunk of the cars that you already want to buy will somehow magically no longer be available because you can only be this clean to ride and the only ones that qualify as this clean to arrive are, of course, the electric vehicles. And despite the fact that the uh, minister... Casanova Bowen, well, he turns around and tries to tell you that you'll be able to save not just 1000 but maybe $1,800 if you buy the right car in the next couple of years and everything goes the way that they'd like it to go with fuel efficiency standards by 2028. But the single biggest lie, of course, that he tells is, rather than turning around and saying, our policy is Australia is moving to electric vehicles, we are making it happen this way, this way, this way, instead, he's trying to make it seem like you'll still be able to buy the car you want... Car companies can continue to import any particular model they wish. No model will be uh, mandatory, no model will be banned. But of course, if you only end up with four SUVs because that's the amount of cars you can sell before you hit your limit, guess what? It won't be affordable for a car company to actually sell anything in Australia. So therefore, those vehicles become extinct. Oh, but there's no ban here. Our dear friend James Morrow, who, of course, you can see on the US report here on Paul Murray Live and, of course, on Outsiders each and every Sunday morning, this is one of the best takes I've seen in a while. Yes, you will pay more. Bowen's EV scheme is dodgier than Princess Kate's fake photo. We love to keep an eye on how they spend other people's money, about how those in the political class who've got their snout deeper in the trough than any other animal... I'm being polite here. And we're talking about, of course, a Prime Minister who spent how much money on Toto One flying around the world, planning to do it again soon. Then there's Richard Miles, who spent millions of dollars flying around this country on private jets because he likes the private jets because they land a little closer to his house. Then there's Tony Burke, who, of course, spent tens of thousands of dollars on a four-day trip 
with a staffer to the United States for something that wasn't part of his job. Then there's the Assistant Treasurer who refuses to cut your petrol taxes but decided to spend $40,000 on car trips so he could get in the limo between his house and Parliament House. And then, of course, when it comes to climate change, Adam Bant. Well, he's the holiest one of all, isn't he? Oh, no, that's right. He, of course, was using taxpayer funds to hire private government jets so he could go and make points about climate change all the way around the country. Do as I say, not as I do. Then there's reporting from The Guardian today that has found that there are four members of the federal parliament, two current, two former ministers, who, uh, well, just accidentally found themselves in Melbourne in 2022. They found themselves in Melbourne in 2022 because there's just this little horse event. But oh, they had official duties, other things to do. Interestingly, uh, the one... Uh, the uh, female that you can see there is Annika Wells. She's the aged care minister. Here's the receipts as produced uh, via the uh, official government websites and produced uh, in The Guardian this afternoon, is that on the 31st of the uh, 10th, she flies to Melbourne. On the 1st, she spends a little bit of money on the limos going around. And then on the 2nd, she flies out. Well, what was happening in and around that particular date? Well, we can tell you. Uh, the Melbourne Cup. Now, according to this, a spokesperson for uh, Ms Wells has said that she appeared at the racing event as the sports minister, but her reason for travelling to Melbourne was the next day where she was providing a speech at the Melbourne Institute, presumably before she got on the plane to fly back to Brisbane. But, geez, wasn't it convenient that she was able to fly in the day before, be there for the race, and then fly out the day after? How convenient... You, of course, pay for all of this. But she was doing it, of course, because she was the sports minister. So, Paul, what is the story here? Well, two parts. One, the Prime Minister, a couple of years ago, told all MPs and ministers, don't go to the cup. Why? Because it looks like you got your snout in the trough. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that she says she was there as the sports minister, she was not a guest of Racing Victoria. She was not sitting in the official stands. Instead, she was rolling around in the birdcage. She was rolling around the birdcage as a guest of the Furphy Brewing Company, which, last time I checked, is not part of the responsibility of the sports minister. But she got the chance to fly down there on the taxpayer dollar, pretend she was doing a little bit of work either side, bang out a speech before she flies home, all good, and end up as the guest in the birdcage of a brewing company. And then when anyone turns around and asks, I was there for official reasons, the official reasons being the Furphy Brewing Company. Now, if the name rings a bell, it's because she is the aged care minister. And this minister, who considers herself to be quite the special specimen when it comes to the politicians amongst us, particularly talented, with a big future in front of herself, who knows? She may well end up falling into the KK world. Well, she continues to fail her way up, become the leader, become the Governor-General, become the President of whatever is after that. Well, she, of course, yesterday announced a brand new policy, which means that the people watching this program right now, the people uh, viewing this online in a few days' time, you'll be paying more for your own aged care. But when it comes to flying to Melbourne, getting around Melbourne and going to the Melbourne Cup, mm, somebody else can pay for that. Also worth noting about other people's money here, there's plenty of stories as well about the number of politicians who just waste money by booking cars that sit around forever and then they cancel them. You see... No one's job in the Australian federal government is to save money. If it was, they would save some money. How is it not somebody's job inside the NDIS to save money? To say, well, hang on, that plastic chair that you're trying to sell me for 400 bucks, I can find on the internet for 100 bucks. How is there not someone in their office that turns around and says, Minister, look, I know you're the Minister for Sport, but unless you're actually going as, like, a proper guest of Racing Victoria... Unless you're actually sitting sort of next to the boss of the person running the carnival rather than the birdcage in the Furphy Brewing Company, then perhaps it's not the best idea. But you see, they're all in it for them. And we just have to pay. We just have to stand back and pay. Now, in the United States, a few things worth mentioning. Now, as you know, today is the day where Donald Trump and Joe Biden, well, they turned around, they're both officially going to be the nominees of their party. What happens next is uh, around summertime in the US, winter our time, around July, they have their big conventions when it's officially, officially known, but basically these are the advertorial days where everyone stands around and says that Biden is the second coming or Trump is the evilest ever or the other way around that Biden is the worst ever and Trump is the second coming. But 
there is somebody that I wanted to pay a little bit of attention to because he's polling 15%. Now, you don't see this in the head-to-heads, but he's polling 15%. Now, whether that 15% is enough to stop Joe Biden or Donald Trump from being the president, we'll all have to learn together. But Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a person who used to be a Democrat, so presumably takes from them, but who knows, but now is running as an independent. Now, I'm not going to pretend that he hasn't said some pretty kooky things, of which I deeply disagree with, but 15% of the vote is 15% of the vote. So you should pay some attention to what he's planning to do, because remember, if you have 10% of the vote, you actually qualify as being able to make it to the presidential debates. So if there was a debate, it would be a three-way debate between Biden, Trump, Kennedy. And when 70% of the country doesn't want to vote for Trump or Biden, maybe the guy in the middle can turn 15 into 17, 17 into 19, 20%. Who knows? But he apparently has decided on whom his vice presidential candidate is going to be. He'll announce it in the next couple of weeks. But some of the uh, people on the shortlist, wow. Apparently Jesse Ventura, the former Minnesota governor, professional wrestler before that, And then the great Aaron Rodgers, who was, of course, supposed to be playing with the New York Jets next season. But he's a man who has been injured. In between training camp, he may end up as the vice presidential candidate. Watch this space. Quick break. Back with more. Plenty to talk about here on Paul Murray Live. Great debate. Joe Hildebrand, Bronwyn Bishop. Let's do that for the rest of the show. Let's get into it. It'll be fun. You know how good these two are. More in a sec. Oh, how we love a good debate, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have one this evening. None other than the wonderful uh, Joe Hildebrand, read him in the Telegraph, hear him in Albo's ear at uh, many opportunities, the wonderful Bronwyn Bishop, always shooting straight for us here at Sky News, and we love her, of course, carry over champ. So, I do love spin, because we all know that 150 people who were released from detention because the High Court said one uh, had to come out, so they went one out, all out. And then the paperwork, uh, uh, so then quickly we came up with a system for it. The system, of course, then didn't work, which means that all of them, uh, well, ended up not having visas for a couple of days, uh, which, of course, is just not a small problem because, of course, part of their visa conditions was that you have to go and report so we know where you are because we know where your pass was. Um, Even people who had broken that trust since they had been let out, um, well, those... Criminal cases are all now going to disappear about that part of those criminal cases because of the visas. But how does the Prime Minister describe this problem? Well, there was uh, a technical issue, and that technical issue has been resolved. All of the visas have been uh, issued in an appropriate way. This is a technical issue that goes back to 2013. Nothing to see here. Technical <laughs> issue. You cannot believe a word that comes out of that man's mouth. There is no such thing as a technical issue in a piece of subordinate legislation, which is what this is. It's a regulation. And it was made by Brendan O'Connor, who is now the Minister for Skills and Training. Well, I hope his skills and training are a damn sight better than when he signed off on his regulation. Because thanks to Joe Kelly, who did his home, did wonderful homework and uh, picked it up on the Register of of Legislation, Um, it shows that it says that a particular subsection of the Migration Act shall apply to people who are in detention. But then a little further on it says it will pick up people who are not in immigration detention. Now, that means that the minister, Mr O'Connor, didn't read it, and he signed it. And the thing with a piece of... um, uh, regulation is that when you sign it, it becomes law. It can be challenged by the by the House, but it is in, in law. And it goes through a rigorous procedure. It normally goes off to the Regulations and Ordinances Committee to be looked at, which is chaired by a government member. That's a Gillard person. And he has the hide to come out today and try and imply it was during Abbott's time. I mean, the man is honestly incapable of telling the truth. But I think part of this is because many of the people who day-to-day cover politics out on the round, right, they weren't around five years ago, ten years ago, in the cycle. So basically, oh, look, it's all in the yesterday basket. But I think this is a distraction from the actual conversation, Joe, which was... And and the government did a very clever job of trying to work out to, to, to make it seem like the problem is in the past not the consequence that existed now. So is it part of the story? Yes. But is the consequence of the failure to see the problem that people who had already allegedly breached the visa 
are now completely back to square one and 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 uh, and off the hook. Well, I think it's a bit like when a cop, the cops catch a murder and they try to pin every other unsolved murder on him because he's the one they've got. So I think I think we should be able to walk and chew gum here. Like clearly the visas were invalid. That did happen during the um, the Abbott era, I believe. That no, doesn't. You just said the Gillard. You just said when the White House said. This, this is. She just said when the law was said? put in place. The, okay, this is oh, sure. Okay, fine. Okay, my apologies. And but furthermore, point being, they said they'd reissued the visa. If it's invalid, you can't reissue it. Can okay, you? but again. So did he make no, a new regulation? No, they reissued a valid visa. No, not the, was, they haven't reissued an okay. invalid visa. Can we get to today? It was existing a proper visa, and they failed to do it. All right. Yes. Either either way. Let's get to today. Whether it was Abbott era or late dying days of Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd or whatever. Point being, um, you can just say, all right, this was the mistake then, and you can say, all right, well, they should have known about it, they should have checked it, they should have double-checked, or someone should have picked it up when they brought in these new visa conditions that turned out to be applying to an invalid visa. Therefore, the conditions are attached to nothing. Therefore, you can't enforce the conditions. But, again, I think it's, it's more just the whole general mess and the failure to anticipate no. problems and anticipate possible no. outcomes. Dating He's offering criticism no, here. No, no, okay, no, no, Joe. Okay, in that case, I Joe. changed my mind. They're doing a wonderful job. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> I true. speak fluent <laughs> Joe, and Joe, Joe was saying they have screwed this one up. <laughs> They've tried to put the blame on a previous government. They don't I'm not take pretending responsibility the for everything. Here. Correct. It's worse. If, if there are, you cannot reissue an invalid visa... So, what, did Giles make a new regulation mm. or was there already existing a proper visa that should have been used and it was his error to use the wrong one? Oh, I agree. And this is and the yet, point where today... Get all this no, I think, no, no. That, but that, who lost their job out today? Because Absolute the conditions have been rubbish. attached, a bunch of lawyers have found out that, no, that Joe, these visas bunch... aren't, aren't, in fact, valid. But the minister is not a passenger. The minister no, I know, is... No, no, exactly what I said, yeah. that the, the government hasn't Skills done so that. Okay. At what point did these people lose their job? Like I know, that, I know the standard has been set, which is we're a fresh government and we couldn't possibly lose a minister because if we lose a minister, we're one one step closer to the inevitable twenty five years down the track, right? But they wouldn't get rid of Gallagher for lying. They don't get rid of these people for incompetence. So what is the, the standard? I give here? you the uh, always the answer: one rule for socialists and one rule for everybody else. <laughs> I don't disagree. And this is a socialist government, and it behaves exactly like that prime minister who cannot even tell the truth. On a matter like this. Well, at least you've got the faction right this time, because both Brendan O'Connor and Andrew Giles are from the socialist left. Well, but yes, no, they have not. They have not. Um, uh, it's, it's fair to say that Andrew Giles has been spectacularly underwhelming in handling See you later. this issue. See you later. Yeah, Somebody's got to go. And again, if they're not going to go, look. And again, there we can let's agree. let's not do what the New South Wales Police Commissioner did today, which was to turn around and say the whole problem with the operation was the media <laughs> advisor. Right. Like, let's not pretend that's the problem. There's a lot of issues here that deserve it. And look, the reality is is that part of what was exposed at the end of last year was an incompetence issue in and around this decision, around the preparedness for the decision. Right? That that when they came out, they came out with no security, some with no visas at all. That's the reporting of the far right-wing ABC, by the way. Um, so we know the mess that this has been. The government has very cleverly worked around, and apparently they worked it out on the weekend. It turns up as an exclusive a couple of days in, and then they've got time by the next morning to turn it into technical mistake. It's no such thing. Correct. Look at the reality, look at the trail, don't look at the spin. Now... Um, uh, uh, was it, in fact, the lawyer for one of the people who'd been released who was about to be recharged who might have brought it to the attention of the mm. government? Yeah, that's Is that exactly, the way it got that, there? That's exactly that's what, exactly what happened. Yeah. They didn't discover it at all. Yeah, correct. No, Good been, question. I mean, it would have been, seriously. Yeah, it would have been a lawyer coming I've never heard such the... a spin job from the moment the announcement was made. Oh, a technical... Yeah. It's a goddamn mistake in the original regulation. But, what, but, but OK, let's, ta let's take one step to the side. What does it say about the way that our politics is being uh, adjudicated on, reported upon, that people fall for the spin as opposed to seeing what the actual responsibility of a minister is? Because I think that gets exposed as well in the past 24 hours, that we've, we've gone down the sort of the rabbit hole of the who, what and when and where as opposed to... Hang on, guys... They aren't up to the gig. And if they aren't up to the gig because they're not reading the piece of paper, the person who's handing them the piece of paper isn't up to the gig because they're not reading the piece of paper. And where do you go back through that many hands that they weren't able to see? No T and no I. No. It was, they went ahead with what they thought was the proper visa that they were using and the solicitor mm. acting 
for yeah. one of these yeah, people, yes. says, I've got a defence here, and points it out to them. Yes. And they then concoct... That's, concoct that's what I'm story, saying. That's what I'm saying. And they, the whole of that press gallery, who are, what, 12? They then come in and say, oh, yes, well, of course, it's a technical... How the hell would you... Can you have a technical error in a regulation, for God's sake? But look, I, you know, again, I don't know. I don't have the roll call, but I, I guarantee the people at the press conferences no, today <laughs> would have been the junior burgers, not the senior well, it's ones. it's an error, but it's a historic and, one. And, and, again, if, if it was indeed not an avid error mistake... And it means that Brendan O'Connor, you know, who is a minister... Is he's terribly, a, terribly... He's a minister in this government. Okay. Check his regulations. Hmm. Which ones right. hasn't he been reading properly this time? Skills I, and training... I, Hasn't got me. All right, let's take a quick break. We've got plenty more to talk about, including the changes in aged care. We've got so many emails about this, about wanting to know the details and following it along. Of course, this is all from the Minister, who was offered the Melbourne Cup, even though the Prime Minister said, don't go. And she, despite, despite the fact she says, oh, I'm also the Minister for Sport, she was in the furfy tent. More in a sec. Thank you very much for watching. We've got plenty to talk about here with Joe Hildebrand and with Bronwyn Bishop here on Paul Murray Live. Uh, now, let us get into this, aged care. So, mm. the government has sat around a table with a bunch of people representing industries, unions, workers and presumably patients, I hope at some point <laughs> here, uh, to decide what changes need to happen with aged care. Now, aged care in and of itself is as complicated as uh, disability care and there's many... a many a tranche to discuss. If only we had a minister here uh, who'd been across this sort of area, and thank goodness we do, in your good self. The government is not responding to its own report effectively right now. They're just throwing up all the test balloons, which include um, people having to pay more if they're considered to be richer people. Now, they're not saying that... They're saying the home is off the table, but people like Mike Baird, who's now part of the industry, former New South Wales Premier, I agree with the eye roll, um, he's saying things like uh, extra money for food, uh, $20 a day, all of this stuff. Of what you've read, is there one particular thing that concerns you that the people watching us who are on the verge of aged care or it will be in their life for the next 10 years need to know is the devil in the detail? Look, there are several points. One, the government increased the wages for aged care workers... Uh, by 15% and said it let people believe they were going to wear that expense. Well, clearly they're not. 50% of people who are in residential care are pensioners and they simply pay uh, the vast majority of their pension and nothing else. Mm. Um, people who are um, self-funded retirees already pay. And the way it works is there is something known as um, extra service. And people who are running aged care facilities, uh, will usually have a balance. They'll have pensioners who are paying virtually nothing for rent and all those other expenses. And you'll have self-funded retirees who are paying for extra service. They might get little bits and pieces of maybe a glass of wine at dinner, whatever. Mm -mm. But there are fewer people in residential aged care today than there were when I was the minister. It's basically 50-50 now about in-home and no. care, isn't it? No. No? No home no. packages? No, okay. there are m many, many more home packages. Right, OK. And when I was the minister, I think we had about 217,000 people in resi care and 3,000 homes. Today, there are 173,000 people in residential care and the number of homes has diminished under 3,000, maybe 2,800. Um, but the problem is this. Because there's been increased expenditure, expenditure on behalf of the homes, you'll hear that they're putting in saying that they're making a loss... If their mix of who they've got as residents is wrong, then, of course, they're going to make, make a loss. Right. So it's a business case as well. Now, the minister um, chaired this task force. That's what I'm saying. She's been it's, across it's, it's their room. And has not bothered to talk to her opposition mm. um, person, uh, which would have made coming to some sort of sensible agreement more, more likely. But... It is this awful feeling in my bones that the government, the socialist government, believes that your superannuation money is theirs. Yes. And they can't wait to get their hands on it. Yes. And so this is just another mechanism designed to take somebody's superannuation who's been unfortunate enough probably to get dementia or to be so ill from a stroke. Um, and their stay is less and less. And if you look at the figures, they're about... Half the people who are in residential care are in respite. Mm. So 
there are when when I was minister, everybody wanted more beds, but I brought in the policy of ha having care delivered at home, mm. and the reason I did that was, a people wanted to be there, and secondly, all the bricks and mortar, the rates, the electricity, the water, all of those things are already paid for. Mm. So all the government has to pay for is delivery of the service. So. There are a whole lot of questions in there that have to be reconciled, uh, but simply thinking that that superannuation money is there and can be stolen by the government is not a good solution. Yeah, I mean, to me, Joe, it is so complicated, but it is so personal, and yeah. it is going to affect all of us because at one point in time we're all going to end up in a version of it. Yeah, um, absolutely. No, we're I, not. I think... Oh, no, I've got to make this point. Okay, Please. sorry. <laughs> okay. No, we are I'm, not. I'm running up against the end of the show, but yeah. 8% of people are going to need... Um, residential care. Okay. Another 12%, this is over 70, Right. will need some form of service at home and the rest of us are going to have a damn good time till we fall off the perch. <laughs> yeah. Fair point, fair point. <laughs> I apologise. All right, Joe, I want to get you in on it. I think the, the point about people being cared for in home is the, the real kicker here and that's where most of this extra that's... money is going. I think it's about a billion bucks or almost a billion um, of the proposed funding will go to people but in home But there are 800,000 people and, who are having some form of care. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. But the point, point being, I think you want to encourage people to be in their home as much as possible. I think it was mm. great that you did that. I think it was great that Scott Morrison, one of the great things that Scott Morrison did, I think when he was treasurer, um, providing extra support for that. But, uh, look, how, uh, the whole purpose of superannuation is for paying for yourself in retirement. The government is not stealing your money by saying that <laughs> if you have got more super and you can afford to pay for your own care, you should do that. That's individual responsibility, Bronwyn. That's a great uh, liberal so, principle. So they will make and sure, then if you can't, only when you can't, make sure the that they're eligible in. for the pension by the time they go in. No, because yes, it's they needs... Will. Based. No. So it's if you not. can't afford it, you get a basic level of no, care. No, but these, and if you these can are, afford it, you can pay for your own care. Joe, and hold these much are more. people who pay their taxes and then save money all their lives. And there are a lot of people who have not done that and simply are happy to be. Well, there, are on lot, the there are lots of people from but all walks of life. But they're not who, super rich they're, people. They're they're lot, they're there are lots of people who have worked hard and paid taxes all their life, but they still can't afford. To, to well, not to have the pension. And, and also... Plenty of pensioners have worked hard and paid taxes all their absolutely life. Absolutely there are. What, what, right. what, so, and then there's plenty, what, but and there's plenty the of people was. working hard now up against cost of living who will face further taxation or further tax increases if the government uh, has to pay for what is... We this all know... This government a, always wants to get their hands on the superannuation. And well, superannuation and indeed, or tax. So what's on their superannuation? That's what they want. No, but the all alternative right. to that is that taxpayers have to pay for it. It's either taxpayers pay for it for someone else, or well, the people who it can is afford their it pay money, it Joe. themselves. It's foregone wages. It's wages they weren't able to have during their life. Yes, right. and well, next... for the purpose of taking care of them in their retirement, we, we, which is I, all they're being asked to do. I'm very good. I'm glad we had good, detailed chats tonight. Uh, we will go into the potpourri of everything else next week. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bronwyn. <laughs> well, Thank you, pleasure. Joe. Thank we'll you, talk Joe. to you again very, very soon. All right, quick break. Back with more here on Paul Murray Live. Don't forget, if you want to join us in Balgala for Our Town, not this, but next Sunday, Our Town at skynews.com.au. Our Town at skynews.com.au. If you can get to the northern beaches of Sydney, say good day. Now... Politicians, let's just imagine, try to get into the process to try to change the world in whichever they way think is good or bad. But every now and then there are politicians that are around it for a long time who just are frustrated with the BS. Perfect example. Texas congressman, his name is Chip Roy. Have a look at this bloke being as straight as it is about the failures of actually turning up to govern with people who don't want to do what they uh, say they're going to do to the people. In 2018, we had the House, we had the Senate, we had the White House, and we had a bigger majority than we have today, and we utterly failed to secure the border. Totally dropped the ball, didn't do it. Why? I remember why. They would say, Chip, we don't have 60 votes in the Senate. Let me be very clear to the American people back home, there is always an excuse for why those who campaign to come to this town fail to deliver. Always. And after telling the truth and pointing out the reality of how so much of politics is performance, no doubt he'll be named a Russian spy by the left in the next couple of days. Here's the late debate. 